Hello and welcome to a new episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Andy Pearslow, set piece coach for AFC Wimbledon. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Andy, as we begin with everyone that comes on the podcast, please take us through your earliest football memory. Earliest football memory, just in life or as a coach or, or, or what? Just in life. Very earnest. Wow. Um, do you know what it would be? It would be um, Euro 96 watching England's, um, it might have been, I forget which one came first, the Holland game or the Scotland game, but one of those two games. Um, and I remember watching it on the lounge on my parents' floor and writing down things that I saw that I was five years old at the time. As in, I was counting like um, corners and throw-ins and, and that sort of thing, shots, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I remember, it must have been the Scotland one because I remember Gaz's celebration and I remember running up the garden and trying to do that. So I, I think that's probably my earliest one, yeah. That's actually pretty remarkable. So you can say the passion and curiosity for set pieces was ignited at such a young age. Possibly, possibly. Like I said, it, it was shots and stuff as well. I think just anything that happened, I just wanted to to record. I have no idea if it made any sense. It probably looked like a lot, but I remember thinking that's what I was that's what I was doing. Um, yeah, whether or not I did it properly or not, I probably didn't. But uh, yeah, no, I remember I remember doing that through that through that tournament. Yeah, strange. And I suppose getting to tasks then, Andy, with so much kind of unclarity re really regarding the role of a set piece coach. I mean, how would you define your own role and responsibility? Uh, my own role and responsibility would be to to take responsibility for all attacking and defending set pieces. So corners, free kicks and throw ins. Um, I've mentioned in the past that initially when I first joined at Wimbledon as the set piece coach, I wanted to look at kickoffs. I wanted to look at goal kicks um, in addition to basically every restart that happened in, in, in the game I wanted to look at. But um, kickoffs, I mean, if you play the game right, you only get one kickoff a game. So there's not too much you need to need to do on that. Um, and goal kicks largely depends on your team's playing style. If you're going direct or if you're playing out from the back, if you're playing out from the back, you're looking at general principles of playing. It's more the manager's area there. Um, so in the end, it's sort of streamlined down into corners, free kicks, throw-ins. That could be throw-ins generally anywhere in the pitch, or it might be a specific attacking or defending long throw. Um, so like an attempt to score. And that's all speaking about the present, but to get to where you've got to today now, Andy, like many others in the game of football, you've took the scenic route to get there through the academy yeah. soon. Yeah, um, it's something. So when I was 17 or 18, um, obviously I was a very keen and enthusiastic player when I was younger. Um, and I got to that sort of age and I was I was all right. I was OK. But I had to make a decision between what would be a very poor playing career, um, probably in the in the basement of non-league somewhere, supplemented by other income, probably teaching or something like that, or trying to go all in on a coaching career from that, go to university, get a degree and, and sort of go through my badges. And I just felt as though the ladder was bigger on the coaching journey. So I've got a better opportunity to, to try and climb that one. So I said goodbye uh, reluctantly to playing when I was 17, 18 years old, 18 years old, I think it was, um, and then started coaching from there. And uh, yeah, it was a long scenic route. I say long scenic route. There are plenty of other coaches that have done plenty more years than I have um, to, get, to get to this level. But yeah, um, yeah, went through, start with grassroots, um, semi-pro under-18s football as well. Um, then going into like performance academies, development centres, and then moving into professional academies after that. Um, and then, yeah, eventually getting to, to first team. Then, I mean, we speak about getting a foot into the industry. Just one point I wanted to touch upon was that of the topic of unpaid internships, which I'm aware you've done one or two, certainly. Um, you certainly need a high risk tolerance for that kind of risk and reward, don't you, Anne? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, I know it's a, it's a contentious subject, really. Um, I've alluded to it in the past, uh, whether you're, you're for it or against it. If you're in the position where you can do it and you choose not to, someone else will. So it, the, the way that I always looked at it was from a competitive standpoint in that this is an experience. And my, my internship was with Luton Town with the first team as an analyst. I was 21 at the time. Um, there weren't many first teams knocking down my door as a 21 year old graduate from Bruno University to, to come in and work with their first team. So this opportunity presented itself and yeah, it was unpaid. So there were other things I had to do on the side to, um, so I, I worked in a bar. Um, I, I was working with a, a PE teaching co uh, company as well. Um, so I was doing bits and pieces around um, the internship, but it was just a case of if I don't do it, someone else is going to get that experience and, they're going to get ahead of me in terms of in terms of the race to try and get to where we're trying to get to. So, um, yeah, it was one of those decisions. And 
yeah, there is risk. But like I said, if you're in a position where you're able to, and I was, I was yeah, fortunate, I was able to supplement it with some income. I was fortunate my parents would allow me to, to stay at their house. So I didn't have rent to pay, for example. Um, so I was in a position where I could. And I think if you can, then, um, and the opportunity is right, of course, then, then it's a good move. I think that's key what you said at the start too. If I don't, someone else will. Because that seems yeah. to be the key differentiator with someone like yourself in your own career, Andy, you know, taking that unpaid internship at 21 before carving out really a niche role as set pieces coach. But before that, now you've obtained academy experience and first team experience at the likes of Luton Town, Brentford, Watford, Wimbledon. I mean, what were the actual series of events which led to you being promoted as set, as set piece coach? Uh, so, so, for, so. I started my academy journey at Brentford. Um, I was very naive. I thought that you had to have a B license and a youth award to get into an academy. Uh, so I waited until I got both of those and then started contacting academies where if I had my time again, um, and I'd advise anyone going through their level two and youth, uh, youth modules to, to do this, contact academies and see if you can come in and just help out voluntarily, or you might even get a part-time role out of it. But shadow coaches learn because your knowledge and your growth will, will accelerate. And then when you get onto those badges, you'll just do much better at them. Um, and you're in a better position once you do get in. So I got into academy football at Brentford and had to learn quickly. It was a ruthless environment. It was brilliant. Um, stayed there for a season and they shut the academy down. Uh, so I had to move on, obviously. So I moved to Watford. Did three seasons at Watford. Worked from under nine's assistant to a under 11's head coach to under 13's, 14's mixed head coach. Uh, left Watford, joined FC Wimbledon in the under 13's. Uh, that was the season that COVID hit. During that time, um, so as I'd started with with Wimbledon 13s, we just developed a little bit of a reputation for set pieces. It wasn't something that we spent hours and hours practicing. We had probably two things that we did, but we practiced them. We'd spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes on the, the last session of the week before a match day, just going through set pieces because it's part of the game. So I don't see why we wouldn't practice it. We're meant to be developing future footballers. So why would you skip out some of the game? It doesn't make sense to me. So it's only 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So went through that and we just scored a lot of goals from it. It, it, it worked pretty well. Um, and it just caught the attention of people further up in the club. Um, I met with Mark Robinson, who was a first team coach at the time at Wimbledon. Um, he invited me to, to go and speak with him about the possibility of being a set piece coach. It wasn't something he had authority to do because he wasn't the first team manager. It was just an idea he wanted to put forward to the manager and wanted to obviously get my, um, my buy-in, given I'd be the one doing it. So I thought, yeah, seems interesting. Don't know how to do it at first team level, but give it a go. Um, it wasn't something that the manager at the time was willing to accept. Um, then COVID hit and I spent lockdown going through set piece. I thought I might as well, we've got an abundance of time now, might as well use this time to try and drill down into more detail on as many things as I can. And one thing would be set pieces. So just went through a load of things. I thought I'm going to put together a presentation, collate as much data and analysis as I can on Wimbledon set pieces and I'll put it together and I'll present it to the manager again. Um, and say this is the reason why I think you could do with this assistance and this is where I think I could add value um, and go from there. Naturally with COVID um, being what it was for football clubs they weren't looking to bring on staff at the time they were looking to get rid of staff and at the same time Wimbledon were in the middle of a, a big relegation dogfight and I don't think that the manager was really willing to relinquish control on something as important as set pieces to essentially a young academy coach that's unproven at first team level which is a fair, like it's, it's, uh, if you look at, look at it logically, it's a fair comment. Um, unfortunately, he then lost his job forever in the year. Uh, Robbo got the position, Mark Robinson, and he, he brought me up from the academy. Obviously, this is now in a new season, so I've moved up with that under-13 side to the under-14s, um, and we continue to do particularly well um, just in terms of our, our performances. And, um, and yeah, just moved up from there. Robbo gave me the call. Amazing. And the proof is in the pudding in terms of success, Andy, because there was a period... I believe between February to September 2021, I have in my notes where you guys actually scored the most set piece goals in the country. I mean, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's one of the, well, it could be a positive or a negative, but with, with the role of set piece coach, there's a lot of objective data to back it up or, um, or conflict with it really to, to show how well or, or not well you're doing. Um, so I think the season before I got the job, Wimbledon have finished last in League One for goals from set pieces. Um, and then by yeah, September, so I think I was what, six months in the job, something like that, um, we'd scored the most goals in the country. So there, was, there wasn't an immediate improvement, but once the improvement, like things had been embedded properly um, and we just got a little bit better at what we were doing, myself included, 
um, it just accelerated. And yeah, by, by I think it was late October, we we'd scored, we were the top scorers in the country from set pieces. An interesting one as well to unpack as well, Andy, in terms of evaluating and measuring success. I mean, when the game is settled, when it's done, I mean, how do you go about unpacking the analysis in terms of identifying the signal amongst all the noise? What do you mean by the signal? In terms of what KPIs would you be looking for, Andy? Or Because there's a lot said about set pieces recently, and I know there was a graphic that was posted last week in terms of the amount of goals Manchester City would have scored mm. from, from the set yeah. pieces in terms of the Premier League this season. But if you measure that in terms of efficiency percentages, yeah. it's not nearly as high as some other teams. So in terms of having that at the table, I mean, what sort of metrics are you looking towards Want to find and measure and success. I think in a, a comparative sense, um, yeah, it needs to be efficiency. So initially, when I started this season, so obviously we did the back end of last season and or um, well, season before last now, I guess, um, and it was just a case of we we had to survive. So it was just focus on everything that we're doing this season. I wanted to measure how we were doing relative to other teams, and I knew for a fact that. The top team, so Wigan, for example, with the top team in our division, uh, Rotherham up there as well, they are going to be able to attempt a significant amount of set pieces more than we are because they're a better team. So they'll attack more. They'll be in the final third more. They'll get more corners. They'll get more free kicks. They get more opportunities to score. So they should score more goals than us by, I mean, law of, of probability and averages. If they get 400 corners and we get 100 corners, they should score more goals. Do, just It just, just makes sense. It's logic. Um, so that's not a good measure of who's better at set pieces. That's just a measure of who gets more. Um, so a much better measure is how many goals you score relative to how many you get. So if we get 100, they get 100. We've scored 17, they've scored 12, but we're better on average. We're, 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 we're better. So that's a better measure. So I was doing that earlier in the season, going through every team's corners and free kicks after every game um, and measuring. Well, it's an easy measure. Either they score or they don't. And I include second phases in that as well. Um, reality was after about two and a half, three months when we're playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, to be going through every team set pieces after every game, just to make a, a, a good measurement or a good comparison is very time consuming. And we don't have a lot of time. Like I'm much better spent using that time to work on my own team and work on who we're playing against. So I stopped doing that early on. It was a good measure while it lasted and it's something that statistical companies and, and websites and that should be using um but yeah as i said it was something um i tried and had to stop because um yeah i had, I had to focus on on the on my own team so when i'm analyz analyzing my own team's ones it will be there'll be i mean there's loads of loads of detail that goes in that i'll be looking for but really you're looking for from an attacking perspective was the movement right was the timing right was the delivery right did we create an opportunity because we might work everything extremely well in the box delivery comes in we win the header and we hit the crossbar it's not a successful set piece because we haven't scored a goal but the idea is a good one the idea was successful because we created an opportunity a really set piece coach we can't guarantee goals we want to and we can create the best possible conditions to score goals but ultimately the execution will then be down to the players so it's the idea that we'll be looking for and similarly from a defensive perspective we might go five games without conceding a goal from a set piece but if we've conceded three shots on target from those from set pieces in each of those games, we're not defending them well. We're just surviving. We're getting away with things. And eventually that will come back to bite us. So it's looking, it's not just looking at did we score or did we concede? It's looking at what was the process that led to that and what was what was the outcome and, and what could other outcomes have been. And whilst we're on the topic of efficiency, let's speak about preparation, because obviously you're doing this amidst the context of a crowded League One season. You not only have League yeah. One to contend with, you have the Papa John's Cup, you have Carabao Cup, you have FA Cup and everything else to manage in between. How many games in advance would you necessarily prepare for, Andy? So initially, I wanted to do um, probably two games in advance. That, that, was my, that was my plan initially because I just always wanted to be ahead of the game. No surprises, anything like that. Um, that was fine initially, but then my, I, so when I first got the job, I was upstairs, I was in the gantry and I was on the radio. So I wasn't just doing the set pieces. I was also doing like analyzing the game tactically and feeding down to, to the assistant manager as well. But things obviously happen in the game. So substitutions will happen. And the last thing the subs do before they go on the pitch is they're with the, one of the coaches 
going through their set piece roles. And it just didn't make sense for me to be upstairs when I should probably be doing that. It's my responsibility. So it should be me doing that. So I moved downstairs to the dugout. Um, and I found that when I was on the touchline, because I would stand up for every attacking or defensive set piece, the assistant manager would sit down because there might be things I needed to, to tweak or alter or, or whatever, um, or have conversations with players. So I would stand up and try and orchestrate that. I found when I was working two games in advance, I'm there looking at an opponent, looking at who's picking up who, and I've got the names of future opponents in my head. So where I'm seeing numbers on the back of shirts, right, number five for, for Fleetwood is whoever, I've got the number five of Cheltenham, who we've got to games in advance in my head so I'm thinking he does that but then it's cra it's clouding my judgment so I'm not being the best I can be at that moment and really all that matters at that given moment is what's happening in that game the, the game two games in advance is completely irrelevant at this moment in time I've got to make sure I'm the best I can be for this game so I stopped doing that I just worked one game at a time for Saturday Saturday that's no problem at all I could spread the workout during the week Saturday Tuesday it just means cramming the process into a smaller amount of time um, and it's, do <coughs> it's doable but it just means it's more work, but it's not a problem. And then in terms of being efficient and adapting to what teams throw at you guys, is there any specific set strategy that you guys would have planned for the games and events, or would you be a lot more kind of agile and quick to adapt nowadays, providing probably some loose principles to your players? Yeah, so, so defensively, we wouldn't change much at all because the most important thing with um, defensive sets up is clarity. So everyone knowing exactly what they're meant to be doing, whether it's the best organisation in the world or not, is probably secondary to how clear they are at what they're doing uh, because the players have to do it with, with exact conviction. Um, and then the organisation obviously is extremely important as well. Um, so we wouldn't change that too much because the more you tweak those things, the less clarity there, there's going to be. Clarity is maybe the wrong word, but there's going to be more uncertainty. So I'll try and keep that as similar as possible while respecting the fact that every team is a slightly different puzzle. So there might be the odd thing we might need to change. For example, the position of, so defending the corner, the position of our two zonal players. So it might be that this team attack the back post particularly well. So our second zone um, defender might be a yard further back instead and the keeper will look to, to stay close to the front and our front zone will get slightly higher. Uh, it might be that another team are really good at attacking the front post. So we have our front zone slightly higher, but we use our ball side edge player to drop slightly deeper. So he's picking up the guy on the edge, but he's standing probably eight yards off of him. So he's also protecting the near post area. But if the ball goes out to the edge, he can still get out and go and affect it. So there'll be little tweaks we might make positionally that would um, still be within the same structure, just slightly more bespoke to who we're playing against. And then the attacking ones, again, it's very difficult to have loads of different ideas for every game because there's just too many games. Um, the players have got enough to think about already without having seven different routines for each game, corners, free kicks, throw-ins, whatever. Um, so again, we'd have principles and the goal never moves from a corner. It's always in the same position. So we're not going to completely reinvent football. We're not going to ping it back to the goalkeeper and then start playing from there. We're going to try and get the ball in the box, whether it's direct or short. And it's just how we manipulate the movement. So there might be subtle tweaks. We might change who goes to the near post and far post. We might change our starting structure. But really, it's going to be the same sort of principles we're abiding by. And do players ever take ownership then in that kind of design stage? Because I know your time is limited enough to a point on the training ground, but when that's happening in-game, I suppose they're given a lot of freedom, right, to react and adjust in the moment. Yeah, they can be. So the players play the game. So they, they can recognise things in opposition players that are much more difficult to recognise on the sideline. For example, teams that switch off when the ball goes out of play. It might be something we could see in analysis. It might just be something that's happening on that day. For example, let's say you, um, I don't know, Plymouth are going away to Sunderland. It's a long old journey. They might have had a rough night's stay at the hotel. There might have been problems at the hotel. You just never know with these things. So they might not be in the best state of mind to be switched on alert all the time. That's not something you can analyse in advance. It's just something that happens at that moment. But the players might be able to recognise that in the game. People are switching off. I don't know, his lace keeps getting untied. So when it goes out, play's going to do that. So we might be able to play quickly, whatever. So that might be, yeah, they've recognised team is slow to set up. So ball goes out for a corner, bang, let's get it down, play, we'll get it back in, we'll take advantage of that. Um, I've got no issue with that because that's solving a real problem. That's solving a problem that is right in front of you that you're able to find a solution. It's difficult for me to orchestrate that from the side because if I suddenly start screaming from the halfway line, they're slow to set up, play quickly. Well, the opposition are obviously going to be a little bit more switched on alert to that. So it's something that the players have to recognise it and work for themselves. And then in, in the design stage, as I said, the players are the ones that have to execute the actions. 
So they need to be, first of all, comfortable with what you're asking them to do. But if they've had a hand in sort of the design, so if I show some clips and say, like, what do you think here? Or this player marks like this, how do you reckon you can get away from him? Like, I've got some ideas. What do you think as well? I just think you get a stronger connection and a stronger buy-in from them. So it's a it's a collective plan. It's not just, right, Andy said, Lou, do this, so let's do this. It's we've come up with this strategy. It's based on the opposition's weaknesses. This gives us a really good opportunity to score. Like, you feel quite excited about it. And what's the culture like then inside the club? Because I'd imagine what's a huge part of your job is the working relationships, both with the coaches and players alike, and in terms of being candid with each other regarding feedback. Well, the culture is always determined by um, what the manager wants, really. So with uh, we, when Robbo was in charge, head coach, not manager, Robbo was in charge, it was a very, um, the, the culture was very much based around ownership and standards and conversation and like we, we were big on football conversation so it wasn't a case of do this do that there would be there, there, there's obviously a place for that and we did use that on occasions but there would be things there'll be conversations around football what do you think here what do you think there um so that was that was very um very much contributory towards the success that we had in terms of collective like finding solutions together when managers change, they all have different styles. So we, uh, women have changed the manager midway through the season. Um, and then it was a bit more do this, do that. So what you've had there as a culture suddenly has to change and you, you have to adapt as you go. Um, same with the working relationship with, with the coaches and the other staff as well. Um, football's football. Everyone's got opinions. I always think it's good to be able to have discussion and debate. I personally, I'm someone that I like to have honest debate with people. Um, I like to be able to voice my opinion. I want to be able to be critical of other people and other ideas because I just find that when you have those conversations and you, you critique each other, ultimately you get to a better solution. Now, it might be that who I'm critiquing comes back with another point that counts as my one, and that's a better solution. Well, if we hadn't had the critical discussion in the first place, we wouldn't have got to that better solution. So it's not a case of being critical and being um, sharing your opinion to always be right. It's just to get to a better solution. So it's really important to have those discussions, and, and we were fortunate at Wimbledon we had that. And with the pressures of top flight football, Andy, then, I mean, would you structure away time in the diary to have those conversations or would the feedback be more informal amongst coaches and players? We tried to. We tried to make it formal um, as well uh, among the staff, really. With, with players, it might be, yeah, it might be um, come and have a chat in the analysis room or in the office or whatever. Um, as staff, we tried to have debriefs after each um, training session and at the end of each day. Obviously, we would do after a match anyway. Um, just about around as many things as we possibly could. But the reality of the schedule, there are always things going on, like there'll be, there'll be press conferences going on or we've got to go to like a I don't know, charity event or something like that. So actually trying to schedule it in of, right, we're going to do it at three o'clock on Thursday every week. It just never worked out like that. So we did have to try and fit these things in where we could, um, which is difficult because consistency is probably the most important thing with that in terms of making it stick as a habit. Um but they're so important to get in. So even if they do end up being informal ones, like on the coach up to a, up to um, an away game or something, it was just important to try and get them in where we could. And then in your role too, like I suppose life as a set-piece coach, as an analyst in such a kind of niche football setting, I mean, it, it can be lonely at the best of times in terms of long hours, trips, etc. Is it difficult to collaborate with others in the industry or have you been surprised by... You know, is there people around there to perhaps share some of the trade secrets? Um, there's not many set piece coaches about, to be fair, at the moment. I think it's something that's gonna gonna grow um, probably quite quickly. Um, the teams that have them tend to do better at set pieces, so I, I think it's something that is gonna come um, and be more more prevalent in the game. So, there, in terms of discussing sort of um, yeah industry secrets and and ideas, it's not easy because everyone working in the game in this role doesn't really have the time to be able to do that so it might be that you you could possibly share some ideas or you might um i mean the, i think the best way you can learn is by analyzing those those teams and sort of working out for yourself and um, that's what i've tried to do when i've when i've had the opportunity to is, is watch other team set pieces and, and try and learn from them um but really just I guess talking with like, other coaches, like first-team coaches, managers, it's not they've never seen a set piece before. They've never coached a set piece before. So they'll have ideas and they'll have ways of um, discussing or critiquing or, or whatever with your work. So you can get sort of some some learning development through that, just through the conversation. Um, I wouldn't say there's sort of a one strategic approach to it. 
it's just a number of different ways to, to try and develop. Um, it might be in the future that it becomes a bigger part of coach education or there might be set piece conferences and that sort of thing. Um, but at the moment, I think it's, it's still very much in its infancy. And as you touched upon there, you're certainly, from the best of my knowledge, a lifelong learner, Andy. But how, in fact, do you envisage seeing set pieces evolving over the years? I mean, perhaps are there any other noticeable trends that you're seeing from any other leagues over the past few seasons? Uh, well, like I said, from, from a corner, um, the goal never moves and the corner flag never moves. So it's never going to be, um, you, you can't suddenly play with 14 players, for example. It's, it, it still is what it is. Um, seeing more invention, I'd say. So City, for example, aren't the biggest team. Uh, they've got a few big threats to Laporte, Diaz, Rodrigo. They've got some good players in the air, Stones as well. But what they do have is phenomenal technicians. So there's a goal that Sterling scored against Norwich uh, last season. I think it might have been De Bruyne took the corner. And Zin I think it was Zinchenko went right to the far side of the pitch, opposite side from where the corner was being taken. De Bruyne has pinged at the width of the pitch to where Zinchenko is. All the Norwich heads turned towards the ball. Sterling was out on the ball with De Bruyne and has started to move into the box. But no one can see him because they're all looking at the ball now. Zinchenko then hits the ball back towards the back post and Sterling just taps it in. Now that's great. It's not going to happen in League One, or it's very unlikely to happen in League One because we just just don't have the players that are of that technical level. So, I guess the 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 trend that I see moving forward is people evolving or teams evolving their set pieces just based on their strengths. So I, I've always said I don't really like preset routines. I'm not a big fan of going into a club and saying right, these are my routines. This is what we're going to do because routines are a solution. And the solution has to be to a particular problem. So in maths, if the solution is seven, it only works for three plus four, five plus two, for example, and various other forms. But if the equation or if the problem is six plus eight, well, seven doesn't work. So you can't use that solution for that problem. And in football terms, if I've got a predetermined routine where I'm going to nip the ball in, spin it around the corner and then arrive from the far post to the near post, but the opposition have two players at the near post, it doesn't work because they're going to be able to defend it. So I can't go in with these preset routines saying this is what we do, because it's only going to work on certain occasions against certain structures. We have to, we have to make sure that we are evolving our set pieces to our strengths and to exploit the opposition weaknesses as specifically as we can, while obviously keeping, I guess, general principles within there as well. So I see it evolving in the sense of, yeah, teams exploiting their own strengths more rather than just being generic. Brilliant. And I mean, as we begin to close, Andy, for anyone that's even slightly better inspired to follow someone like yourself and embark upon a similar career path, what advice would you have for them? Uh, best advice I can give is to do the best that you possibly can in the job you're currently in. So I'd never, um, I'd never planned to be a set piece coach. That wasn't my, I, I didn't, um, I didn't stop playing at 17, 18 saying, right, I'm going to coach corners and free kicks. Wasn't the objective. To be fair, my Ambition still in the future is to go on and be first team manager, wherever down the line that is. Um, but as I said, no playing career um, prior to this role, no first team coaching experience. No one's coming up and saying, right, Andy, can you come and manage our team in the Premier League? Just doesn't happen. I have to work my way up there towards, towards there. Working in set pieces at the moment is a great opportunity for me to get loads of first team experience, specialise in the area, exposure to, to good quality players and coaches and continue to learn and grow. If I hadn't done the best that I possibly could in my academy role, coaching the 13s and 14s, I wouldn't have got that opportunity to then move into the first team role, I don't believe, as a, as a set-piece coach. It was only through doing particularly well in the role I was in, obviously looking at set-pieces as well, that that opportunity presented itself. I found in the past, when I've been doing a job, but I've had my eyes on a future job, my eyes not on the ball in this one, so I don't do it as well. If I don't do this one as well, that future job doesn't come. So the best advice I can give, do the best that you can in the job that you're currently in. That's some very pertinent advice for a lot of people that listen and send me messages each week. But um, Andy, look, very enjoyable speaking to you for the last half hour. Hopefully you enjoyed this half as much as I did. Yeah, absolutely.